We are only getting about 5% of our purchase, home purchases from Californians back in 2002 when I moved, 15% of all the homes sold were going to California. So that migration has kind of dried up. Household formation, I said it was bad. It's really bad. You can see it's dropped down to almost nothing. This is the 12 month moving average we were not so long ago we were well above the long-term average at about 1.7 million households being formed only the middle of 2012 so this is a countrywide thing it's very volatile and when it first started collapsing like that most economists said i don't believe it the census bureau must have done their sums wrong but after six or seven months of it getting worse and worse people are saying well maybe something is happening and all of the articles now are about why it's all the millennials fault <laughs> Uh, it may be, I, I, also, I do believe there's a lot in this millennial thing, but there's other reasons too, which we'll go into in a moment. When in doubt, blame the young folks is always a good idea when you get to my age. So where are all the buyers? Well, for a start, I can tell you where some of them are. I count every foreclosure. This is a couple of weeks old, so it's not exactly right yet. But 232, 767 foreclosures have happened just in Maricopa County since 2008. We only have just over a million single family homes. That's an astronomic number of foreclosures. We've never experienced anything like that in history before. And on top of that, we had nearly 84,000 short sales, which have a similar effect in that you lose your home, you go away with nothing. You just don't have that ding of the foreclosure on your history. It's not quite as bad when people look at your credit report. But it has the same net effect. You've lost your home. You're becoming a tenant. So 26% of all the homeowners had to become either leave the state or become renters. That's why we've got such a big demand on rentals. We have a big supply of rentals because all those foreclosed homes got purchased by investors and turned into rentals. So it kind of supply met demand almost uh, perfectly. But the, basically the sad news is a lot of people who used to own homes are now basically paying their rent to uh, investors of one sort or another. The biggest problem from our point of view right now is that most of them are locked out for loans for seven years. So if the foreclosure wave started in 2008, which it did, that takes us to 2015. So these boomerang buyers that we need are not turning up in any large numbers. They should start appearing next year. That's assuming they've decided that owning a home is a good idea again. They may have decided foreclosure was pretty bad. I don't want to have a chance going through that again. I'll be a renter for the rest of my life. But if they leave aside emotion and do the sums, owning a home, as long as you're going to stay in the area for more than three years, is going to be much more beneficial to your long-term wealth. So. 2015 to 2018 is where we should see demand coming back from these types of buyers and there's an awful lot of them. Only, if only 10% of them come back, that's a lot of extra demand, so next year should be better. Let's see if that theory turns out. The millennials, um, well that's a different question. First of all, let's look at some detail about this penalty box that these people are in. Fannie and Freddie are responsible for more than half of the loans out there. They guarantee them. They have a loan limit of 417 and a seven year wait period if you've been through foreclosure. So the vast majority of people have seven years to wait for foreclosure. Only four years if they did a short sale. So there are some boomerangers coming out because they did short sales. But short sales in 2008 were pretty rare because nobody knew how to do them then. The banks didn't know how to agree with anybody and all the realtors had never done them before so they were learning on the job and it took a year or two to really get short sales efficient. So most of the short sales happened in 2010 to 2012 so they've still got some time to wait before their penalty box period. The only good news is that if you've got a big down payment available, if you've got short sale but you've still got some money for some reason, you can put 20% down and you have to wait two years. The number of people who do that are pretty small. If you're a vet veteran, then it's good news. First of all, you can borrow the entire sum. You don't even have to have a down payment. And for a short sale, the wait period is zero. 
You can do a short sale and immediately get another vault. So, you know, veterans have it good from this point of view. They also only have to wait two years for a foreclosure. But unfortunately, you know, only 6% of the market involves veterans, so it doesn't have a huge impact on the rest of us. FHA loans, lower wait period, only three years for foreclosure and one year for a short sale, but they only got to 271,000. So, you know, big chunk of the market is not able to benefit from that. Only 10% of the loans out there in the last two years came from anything other than the government. Basically, the whole housing industry in the U.S. is a socialist institution. Uh, really strange, because I come from the U.K. where health is a socialist institution, but the housing is completely capitalist, and governments not get involved in lending money to anybody to buy homes. So it's kind of the opposite way around. But, you know, if you're an independent lender, you can do whatever you want, really, as long as you don't want to have it guaranteed by the government. <laughs> so you can... You can choose to lend, and I know we've got the Dodd-Frank Act, but you only have to abide by that uh, if you really want to get approved by the government. You can get a license and you can do pretty much what you want with your own money. Probably most people won't do it because they do like the benefit of having the government guarantee that if the economy gets into trouble, they'll get bailed out. Now we've already seen these millennials, they are uh, having a really good time. It's not that they don't have any money. They're actually spending more on having good time than any previous generation. You've noticed there's been a lot of new restaurants opened in the area. That's true of the whole of the US. They are spending more on eating out than any previous generation. And quite obviously, they spend more on iPads and things like that too. Technology, they will spend on. Houses, not so much. In fact, they don't really care about the kitchen too much because they are out there eating in restaurants. <laughs> So that great big fancy appliance ridden kitchen that we've all, my generation really values, doesn't mean so much to them. They're also not very interested in living in Outer Buckeye or in, even in Gilbert. They like downtown. They want to be where the action is. Uh, they have strong preference for urban living and public transport. If you're a big fan of public transport, which is the last city you would move to? Phoenix. So we are, we are doing terrible in, in attracting millennials right now. They're moving to Portland, to Denver, San Francisco, Washington DC, New York, anywhere but here. Um, we are growing our own okay, so the actual median age is doing okay, and we're getting people to the university okay, but most of them, when they've been through university, they want to move somewhere else that's a bit more hip. This is a problem, because we don't want to turn the whole valley into Sun City. <laughs> so their impact on the housing market. First of all, we all know they're starting families later than earlier generations. It's not unusual now to have the first baby at 33, not 23. And you know, that, this is not something unique to Phoenix. The entire world has vastly lowered its birth rate. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but there are only a few countries now with the same birth rate that the whole world had in 1950, which is like five or six children per female. That is still going on in Niger, for example. Basically places where females do not go to school, do not watch television, and therefore don't know that life could be more fun. <laughs> <laughs> they just have babies and roll them out. It used to be like that everywhere in the 1800s. If you go back to your family tree, you'll prefer all your ancestors had eight to ten children, and only about a hard, half of them made it to age five. So we have lower birth rates, and the important thing about that is it's coming down below the replacement rate. The US is now at 2.0 average per female. 2.1 is considered the replacement rate. So if nothing changes, the population of the US will start to decrease except for uh, immigrants. If you go to some countries like Italy or Germany, it's down to 1.4. They are starting to panic about their population because it's really hard to grow your economy if your population is declining. Look at what's happened to Japan. Their economy, they, in the 1880s, they were saying Japan was gonna go take over the world. Below and behold, they stopped having babies and their economy has been, uh, especially their real estate, has been in bad shape for the last 20 years. So it's important to watch birth rates. We are not 
actually at a desperately low level. Compared with most Western countries, our birth rate is higher at 2.0. Only Israel has a higher uh, birth rate than we do. But most of Europe is down in 1.4 to 1.9 now. And Singapore is at 0.9. They will pay you thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to have babies in Singapore. Now we know that millennials are still blaming their parents. We've got their urban lifestyle to worry about. They like sharing accommodation. They don't value owning cars. They like to be able to use them. But if someone else will drive, that's just great. I have a 22 year old. So he doesn't have a driving license yet, but he expects to get around. <laughs> so either his girlfriend drives, she has a license, or I do, or his mom does. I don't know when that's all going to come to an end, so don't expect me to predict when the millennials will start buying real estate, because I don't know when he will. And I should know more about him. Uh, we have a problem, that we're not really even communicating. If you talk to realtors, there are very few young realtors these days. Most of them are 40 or higher. The young people are not joining the mortgage industry, they're not joining the real estate industry, don't work for builders. I mean, there's always an exception, but when I meet one of them, say a 26-year-old realtor, and I say, how many of your friends own homes? They say, not a single one. Back when I bought my first home, I was 23, and most of my friends were doing it. So it's a very different world. They always say they expect a home one day. 85% of them expect to own a home, but it's just not in 2014 or even 2015 for most of them. So they are renting and they're creating big demand, which the landlords are hastily trying to meet. Previously, they were buying up the, the, the single family homes and turning them into rentals. They've stopped that now. They are full up with tenants. There are very few single family rentals vacant now. So if you're looking for a rental, you're going to have a hard time. This gives you some idea of how many single family rentals there are. This is just a little sector of the valley. This is, happens to be Gilbert area. Every red dot is a single family home that used to be owned by its owner and is now a rental. So this is what happens when foreclosures go through. And this is not, you know, Gilbert is very average. In some parts of Phoenix, it's far, far more. So, so investors are pulling back on the uh, rentals, but the tenants are still coming because population is growing by about 60,000. Central Arizona is expanding faster than the rest of Arizona. We're getting about 85% of the jobs created in Arizona are in Phoenix. So all of the jobs in Yuma, Flagstaff, they're not really growing. Everyone's moving here. And when they move here, the first thing they want to do is rent somewhere, not buy somewhere. So we've only got 2,447 single-family rental listings. Just as recently as January, there were over 4,000. So it's coming down. <coughs> and that's only a 31-day supply. It would normally, uh, they'd normally about, about two and a half, three months would be typical. So anyone, if you know anyone who's looking for a rental, they're going to have to be patient and spend a lot of energy to find one. The other problem is that what's left is very expensive. Most people looking for rental, they want to pay maybe 1100 a month at the most, 1200 at a stretch, 17, nearly 1800 a month. That's the current average of what's available. So it's like everything affordable is already rented. The only thing left are the expensive stuff up in Scottsdale. And the, you know, that's a different type of animal. So it's really tough. Now as a result, I'm predicting pretty confidently the rents are going to go up over the next 24 months because you've got so much demand and not much supply. They have to go up, which again, good news for the landlords. This is all really good news if you're in the landlord business. Uh, the only thing is you should have bought your, all your stuff <laughs> two years ago, not now. But if you bought tons of rentals a couple of years ago, you're in great shape now because not only have they appreciated a lot, your rents are going up too. So tremendous time to have been an investor between 2009 and 2012. It's easier to find condos, by the way. Single family are the things that are in short supply. Even the condos are only down to about two months supply. Now, I wanted to share a few numbers just to put things in perspective here. I count homes, that's what I do for a living. And I love to share the numbers with you. The total number of housing units in Maricopa County, single family plus condos, 1.2 million. 
Right now the assessed value, that's what the tax people have said these homes are worth, that's much less than the real economic value. $240 billion, that's a lot of money, right? It's also a lot of money compared with two years ago when it was only $168 billion. So that's a 43% increase in value for everybody who owned a housing unit of one sort or another. That's a tremendous return. Most people haven't realized that return. And both people who owned it for 10 years have seen it go way up and way down, so they're not so excited. But if you bought in 2012, or before, lots of money sitting there in terms of a current value. Owner occupied, 902,000 rentals, the highest number we've ever seen, 332,000 rentals. Back in 2000, it would have been about 120,000. Now, a lot of press has focused on, oh, it's all these big companies coming in and buying these rentals. That is completely fabrication. Uh, you will find very few people who will agree with me because they haven't added the numbers up. People are very lazy, they don't look at the deeds and count them. They just hear that Blackstone is buying lots of homes and they assume that every rental being bought is being bought by Blackstone. It's not. It's mostly being bought by you guys or people like you. 95% of the rentals in Phoenix are owned by ordinary moms and pops who just decided, you know, I don't think I'll put my savings into an IRA, I'll buy a home and rent it to someone. I think it's a good thing to do. It's always been popular in Arizona. Arizona has more realtors than any other state per pop head of population. And we have more investors than any other state because we all seem to like real estate and we like renting them out. And most of the time we've done pretty good. We believe in it and therefore the, the institutions, they only, they've bought a billion dollars of homes, that sounds like a lot, until you look at it as a percentage of the total. They own less than 5% of all the rentals, never mind what they own of the total amount. So I just want to put that in context when you read the next article that says Wall Street is taking over our rental market. It's not true. Multifamily permits. Don't usually talk about those. The only reason I've got this up is we've just had a really interesting quarter because we had more multifamily permits between January and March than we've had for any quarter apart from one in the last 10 years. So this is unusual and again supports the claim that basically rentals are really hot. Now the big issue I have with these um, apartment blocks, these multifamily blocks, is that nearly all of them are extremely expensive. So we've got a demand for rentals that are sort of like a thousand a month, but what the developers are building is three thousand a month. And the reason they're three thousand a month is they're all on Scottsdale Road or Rural Road. They're at Keeland or in Scottsdale, Tempe, Chandler, as long as it's within about half a mile of that vertical strip, that's where they're building. And they've all got the same idea at the same time. And I'm a little concerned that we don't have 10,000 people who want to live in a $3,000 a month apartment. We've got some, yeah. Nobody knows how many we've got. That's a bit pricey. So we, I think you might have got this message by now. Just to spell it out in case you were half asleep. Demand for homes to buy is weak, while demand for homes to rent is strong. Remember, however, that supply is something that is difficult to change. Demand can change overnight. One way of measuring demand is looking at sales per month. I measure that every week on this chart, and you can see that every year it has come down, but it follows a similar pattern. It hits its peak about now, and then it dies away for the rest of the year. So this is the ideal, if you want to sell, Putting it on the market in uh, February or March and then closing in May or June is what most people do and it works. That's probably when you get the best pricing as well. Because as sales die down, the pressure on pricing also reduces. There's a definite season to the Phoenix market. And although sales have come down one of the last, each of the last few years, actually the sales of normal homes is pretty much the same as last year. What's come down the most are all those rough looking homes, distressed homes. So normal homes are really quite normal but the overall amount has come down. 
The other thing I like to look at, because I don't like to wait till something's sold before I start measuring, I like to look at what's in escrow, because that tells me how business is going to be a month from now. So I look at the listings that are in pending status, and you can see they are well down from last year, but they're following the same sort of pattern as last year. The big question now is, will they dip as hard as they did last year, which is a significant dip in the second half, or will they keep going a little bit more like 2012? If they're more like 2012, we'll actually start catching up with that line and the whole market will start to feel better. So I don't know. It's a really inter Every time I draw this chart, I'm really interested to see what the next dot's going to look like. But then that's just me. So supply is growing, but it's growing not because we've got lots of people trying to sell their homes. Right? It's growing because the homes that are for sale are staying on the market a long time. We do have a higher rate of new listings, 7% more than last year, but that is still lower than most of the years in our recent history. So we, I count every new listing every day, and I track how much, how it compares with May the 13th last year and May the 13th the previous, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a bit weird like that, right? <laughs> this is why my wife has to tell me about what motion to feel. I, uh, therefore, I can tell whether we're getting more or more than normal. And we're actually getting a pretty low supply, but because they're piling up, it feels like a lot when you go to the MLS and take a look or Realtor.com or Zillow and say, let's see what's selling on our street. Wow, there's a lot selling. But they came gradually, not in a big lot. This measures the active listing count. So this is what is available on the MLS. I've taken out listings that are already under contract, and you can see there's been a drop since uh, 2010 but it's been growing for the last two years. There's a seasonal pattern here too, but they also, the mix, the ones that are in orange or uh, the light blue are the lender-owned homes or the short sales. Very few of those around now. Most of it is normal listings. Back in 2010, more than half of what was available was distressed. The other thing I like to measure is how active sellers are in cutting prices. That tells you a lot about how good the market is. Every week, each one of these vertical things is one week, the blue bars are people who raise their price, the red bars are people who drop their price. So you can see that compared with last year, there are twice as many price cuts as there were this time last year. Now even in a good market, there are more price cuts than price increases. Why is that? Because when you sell your house, you're always tempted to ask more for it than it's really worth. Because you always think, well I can always come down, it's hard to go back up. People do go back up, <laughs> but there's more of a tendency for every home seller to ask too much compared with market than too little. And when the market's bad and they've asked too much, then they tend to have to drop the price because nobody's come to see it at all. So we've seen pretty significant uh, price cuts. The only bit of good news there is it is the last few weeks have dropped a little bit down from the peak. The other thing that you can measure is the listing success rate. How many listings succeed in being sold and how many get cancelled or expire? For many years, going back to 2011 here, we've been for lender-owned properties, which are the orange ones, we're up in the high 90s. That's now down to 87. Normal listings have been about 70 or 80 percent, so four out of five listings were selling. That's dropped down to only about two out of three. That's not bad, that's actually the long-term average. So we've gone from selling well to average rather than poor. The things that are in trouble though are this light blue line there, that's short sales. They're getting much more difficult to close, that's below 50% now. There aren't that many of them, but quite a lot of them are failing to sell. That's not necessarily because they weren't marketed that well, because, but it's because banks are not being so good about agreeing to taking a loss on their loan. They're feeling more optimistic about their general condition. They're not that keen to agree to a short sale anymore. Especially as most of the people who have genuine distress have already done it. So the cases are harder to prove these days. Now, I've beaten you up a lot with some miserable looking charts, so I'm going to put some cheerful ones together. This is the average price per square foot of what's under contract, and you can see that has gone up a lot in the last few years. And it is not coming down, it is kind of stabilized at that 132 
$133 per square foot. So what's getting contracted, the thing deals that are being signed are staking out that's fairly high number. If prices were to come down sharply, that would have to come down sharply first. So prices are pretty stable right now. But they have somewhat lost in the last couple of months their upward direction. It's also really good news if you're in the business of listing homes over $3 million. Because that this quarter, this last quarter that just completed, was the best year we've had for sales of homes over $3 million since 2008. And uh, there's two good reasons for why these super expensive homes are doing well. One of them is that the stock market has done pretty good over the last two years. And therefore people who are in that market or owning businesses who are on the stock market tend to feel pretty wealthy. And one of the things they like to diversify into is real estate. If they currently live in Washington or Illinois or somewhere like that, the idea of a nice expensive home on the golf course in DC Ranch is appealing. So that market is very buoyant. The other big factor is that it's really easy to get a great rate on a jumbo loan these days. Uh, it's not going to be guaranteed by the government, but lenders have looked at the default rate on jumbo loans over the last two years, and you can count the number of people who have failed to pay on time their jumbo loans on the fingers of one hand. Basically, everybody is making their payments on time. So people in banking have said, well, you know, if the market's a bit dodgy, let's lend it into the safest hands. And so if you want to borrow $2 million and you can qualify for it, you'll get a really competitive rate, lower than the $200,000 loans, which is something we've never seen in history before. It was always been more expensive to borrow more money because it wasn't going to be backed by the government. Another end of the market which is doing really well, you may be able to rule this, but this is mobile homes. So they are actually selling better than they have since 2007. I don't know why, but they are. <laughs> Completely different from the condo or the single family market. So, as I said, this is more complex. I can't really explain it all to you in, in 45 minutes, but that's interesting. And before I finish, I want to talk a little bit more about new homes. It's only 10% of the market. It used to be 30% of the market. These are the home sales counts for Maricopa County. We were only doing 310 in January 2011, and we got up to a peak of 974, but since then it's been dropping back down, and the first four months of this year have been very disappointing. <coughs> you talk to any developer here, uh, they were expecting to do a lot better. They've got more specs available than they really want to have, and if you're interested in buying a new home, you can probably get yourself a pretty good discount right now, or a special deal. And when you put that into context, that's what we just looked at over there, really almost noise compared with the typical number of new homes that would have been sold in the Phoenix area. Now, 4,378 was the peak, that's probably too many. We were selling them then because everybody could get a loan and people were buying five or six new homes just to sell them to somebody else. <coughs> Crazy times. But we won't be back to normal till we're selling 2,500 a month new homes. That's going to be a long time from now yet. So demand has to return to normal. Everything is cyclical. So one thing I know for sure is demand will return to normal. It may go be above normal. Right now, my theory about how it's going to happen is this. Remember what I said about the future, though. <laughs> Mortgage applications are currently at their lowest level since December 2000. The banks do not like that. This is not just for refinancing. Refinances are low because interest rates go up, you're less tempted to refinance, but they're low for purchases too. They are starting to have to, well, they've actually laid off a lot of workers in, that work in loans and they don't want to do any more. They want to start lending more. And to do that, they're going to have to start lowering the limits that they have on FICO scores. Most lenders have basically stopped at the 700 mark and won't go below last year. I predict that this year they will start going from 600 to 700. That will encompass a lot more people. So those potential first-time home buyers who've got typically a 650 score, 
they will now get an approval that they wouldn't have got last year. This is not going to happen on one date. It's going to, each bank is going to change its rules gradually, and bankers are not known for being really brave and moving fast. They will do it gradually, but their livelihoods depend on selling more loans. They can make lots of money from these loans because they can borrow from the government for next to nothing. So as long as everybody, or at least a reasonable number of them, repay it, they can still make good money. Rents are going to increase. That's going to drive more tenants to consider owning. At the moment, they're not considering it, but if their rent goes up by 5 or 10%, they'll at least think about it, especially if their parents tell them to. Um, or if just a handful of millennials start buying homes and telling their friends about it. That would help. <laughs> they will eventually join the game, but I don't know when. But I can tell you with certainty that supply is going to be an issue in the future because we have built so few homes over the last six or seven years. We have never had such an underbuilding in Arizona or in the country. Not since the 1920s have we built so few homes. People don't tend to sort of stop and think about that, but the population has actually continued to grow despite what I said about birth rates. And if we actually had immigration reform, we'd probably get even more immigration, and that would actually be really good for the economy and the housing market. I speak as an economist. Immigration is really healthy for an economy, right? <laughs> I'm not a politician, and I don't even vote. But believe me, as a mathematician and economist, more immigrants means a better economy. That's just a 100% fact. <laughs> um, supply, when it becomes an issue, is going to drive prices up. So right now, supply, supply is only OK. Demand is low. So prices are actually going to drift downwards a little bit for the rest of the year. That's the most likely answer. But five years from now, when demand comes back, there's going to be another significant move up. And I don't know when that's going to be because this is clearly unpredictable. You will get a little bit of a warning, but not a year's worth. So that's where we stand, and I think I've got one more summary chart before we open it up for questions. Are we okay for time? Yeah. Uh, sorry if this is a bit small from the back, but the short-term outlook is the market is stable. It's not a bubble. It's not bursting. In fact, my big gripe about it is it's too boring. I can't, you know, I look at one week and it looks really similar to the week before and I'm scratching my head, what do I put in my comments this week? <laughs> That's a problem for me, I want it to change more. Uh, near time changes over the next three months I don't expect to be great. There'll just be a little bit more demand coming along. Buyers, they recognize they have significant negotiation room because buyers, they tend to have looked at lots of homes, so they get a much better feel for the market than sellers do. Sellers only look at their own home and don't consider all of the competition. Buyers know they've got a lot of negotiation power and they intend to use it. So if you're selling your home, remember that. <coughs> you don't have to concede, you don't have to surrender, but you have to be reasonable because they have the upper hand. Pricing has no upward pressure right now. We'll probably drift lower in the second half because the second half of each year has basically a slight tendency to be weaker. New homes and resales will be lower this year than last year. That's a surprise to everyone. It's even a surprise to me. But we've had you know, more than four months worth. It's very unlikely we can catch up now. Already talked about rentals. Uh, one thing that is hard to measure is rental vacancies. But the, those people who I know who manage rentals are telling me they've got incredibly low vacancies now, like 500 homes and only three of them are available. Normally, 10% of rentals are available at any one point in time, so 2% is really unusual. Watch the household formation numbers. The census puts those out every three months for the previous three months. Everybody's ignored them for the last 10 years, but I think it's probably the most important thing to watch is are they going to recover? That will be the first sign that millennials are joining the game again. Uh, high and luxury, I still think that's going to do quite well for the rest of this year, probably not quite as well as last year, but the first four months of this year were just terrific for the high end. And by high end, I mean sort of like a million and a half upwards. Between a half a million and 1.5, it's kind of okay, but nothing special. 
the whole market's going to improve when lending standards get loosened. And people are very nervous about that because we've seen what happened when lending standards just got thrown away. It all ended in tears, but at the moment lending standards are a lot stricter than normal and they could loosen them up quite a lot before the market would have a problem. And demand will probably improve greatly if lenders do that easing up. Now there was a, a, a I didn't read the full article, but there was news today that um, the government was starting to relax a little bit. Fannie Mae, Freddie, and saying, okay, let's, we're not gonna tighten things up, we're actually gonna loosen a little bit. We're certainly not gonna drop the limits on the loans from 417, which some people were scared of because FHA dropped their limits last year. Uh, so I think there's going to be a push to try and... The government is waking up to the fact, and, the, and Wall Street's waking up to the fact, that the housing market is actually in trouble. In January, they were in denial. I was saying it was in trouble, but nobody was believing me, and nobody listens to me anyway outside of Phoenix. But, <laughs> but now every article you read is saying housing is trouble. And if housing is in trouble, the whole economy is in trouble. So all of the government is starting to think, well, let's not make anything worse. Let's at least ease up. And that means with the banks, we'll start to find ways to lend more money and get the demand up. So that's where things stand at the moment. Uh, I think I've got to the end of my charts. Yep. And uh, be happy to take any questions you have. And so would Tina, I think. Yes, Tina. Anybody like, yes? Uh, you mentioned there'd be uh, a warning sometimes before this five-year period uh, came to be where housing started to increase as far as prices go. Uh, what would be a few of those uh, warnings? Well, my favorite one, of course, is the Cromford Market Index. The uh, question for those people who didn't hit here was, what would be the warning that tells us that the market is starting to take off again? I deliberately created the Cromford Market Index as to be the most leading indicator it could be about where the market was going. And it can be up to 15 months ahead of the actual change in price direction. So, uh, for, for example, in 2005, the Cromford Index started going up in April of 2005. But prices didn't peak until June the following year. So 15 year, months later, prices peaked. They didn't even start going down for another year. They, they just sort of hovered around that mark. So if the Cromford Index goes well through 100 and above 110, that's the first sign that things are warming up. If it gets to above 150, look out. Prices are going to go up fast. Anytime it goes above 150, prices will go up fast, but not necessarily then. It could be up to a year later. But I, I, to myself, I think you know, if it's 150, I should be buying, not selling. <laughs> when it's... Um, I took my own advice, I actually bought my current house that I live in in March, sorry, April of 2011, which was kind of the bottom of the market, short sale, all that sort of thing. So it's not that I just sell it, I actually follow my own advice too. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Uh, do you have any predictions on infill building? Any questions on infill building? Well, infill is the rage right now because um, People are starting to realize that, that, that when you get an awful long way from the city center, you're not going to have any young folks coming to look at your houses. And uh, the builders are starting to worry that you know, if the, all they do is sell things to baby boomers, baby boomers are not a great growing generation. They're starting to die off. They're retiring. They're downsizing. The millennials are the ones who are going to grow families. And they start, they're all starting to say, well, maybe we should build more attached homes in downtown Chandler or Tempe or Scottsdale. The problem is the price of land down there. Have you looked at how much it costs to buy an acre downtown Phoenix? It's just crazy. So if you buy land there, you're going to have to build something really tall to fit enough people in it to make it. Uh, one thing that's happened over the last two years is land prices has just rocketed out of all recognition. And particularly downtown. So we've got actually, if you look around Phoenix, there's lots of areas that are not really used. They're just empty space. But you're surprised how expensive that empty space is if you actually come along to the owner and say, I'd like to put an office on it or an apartment block. Whereas the land out in Coolidge <laughs> is still you know, $1,000 an acre. Or out um, Tonopah mm -hmm. way. But downtown land, very expensive. So there's a lot of desire to build downtown. And I think it will happen, but people are going to have to be much more creative architecturally to fit lots of people in a very small 
piece of land. The good news, of course, is the millennials, they don't need huge numbers of garages because they're all sharing cars or not, and they're like using light rail as well. So you don't need as much space as you would have done 20 years ago where everybody wanted a three-car garage in their downtown apartment. Okay, any more questions? Nope. Mike, I want to say more. Yep. Thank you very much. Everyone, thank you for Thank you.